In this video, we are going to cover big topics such as delayed cord clamping, postpartum hemorrhage, delayed infant bath, and also common signs of afterbirth in labor and what to do and what to expect for the most optimal birthing experience. My name is Dancy Pinkston, also known as Fearless Mama, for those of you who don't know me. And this is part five of my Labor Signs and Stages series. So if you haven't yet, be sure to check out that whole series as it is packed full with much needed information to help you break the fear of the unknown, which is one of my main goals for the Fearless Pregnancy and Birth course. With that being said, let's get started. So we are about to go over the entire stage three of labor and stage three just includes one phase which is the birth of the placenta or also known as afterbirth. The afterbirth stage is the final stage of labor and begins with the birth of your baby and ends with the birth of the placenta. At this time the placenta will naturally detach from the uterine wall and be expelled through the birth canal. How this happens is under the influence of the hormone oxytocin, strong regular contractions work to decrease the size of the uterus, which helps shear the placenta away from the uterine wall. Skin to skin contact between you and your baby or your baby's first attempt at breastfeeding releases more of that good oxytocin, furthering the uterine contractions and therefore playing a huge role in the delivery of your placenta, while also preventing postpartum hemorrhage. The placenta delivery should never be rushed, nor should it be tugged on for health risk reasons, such as pelvic organ prolapse, cord snap, placental rupture, pieces of the placenta being left behind, and maternal hemorrhaging. This third stage is a time of reaping all the rewards of pregnancy and labor as the hormones of love and peace surround the room as you meet your new baby. So let's go over the signs of afterbirth or what to expect during this phase. The delivery of your placenta roughly happens about 20 minutes after birth or safely longer but usually within the hour of the birth of your baby. You may experience some strong crampy like contractions as this is your body's natural way to shrink back your uterus especially while you're breastfeeding as the surge of oxytocin is present during this time. Some moms find it super hard to cope with these types of contractions after birth and so a well-respected mama in the birth world, Mama Natural, recommends the supplement After Ease to help with those afterbirth pains, especially if this is your second or third baby as that seems to be worse. You may experience a small gush of blood as your placenta separates or the lengthening of your umbilical cord as the placenta lowers down. Some extra signs that you may experience during this time is a strong rush of endorphins of love and peace. In combination with this, you may experience a lowering of your adrenaline hormone, and if not balanced with a warm, comforting environment, it can create a cold, shivering feeling for the mother and the baby. The greatest visual of this rush of endorphins that I have seen is from the birth of YouTube star Sarah Therese. In her last home birth video, she explains how she was extra loopy due to pregnancy insomnia, but what she left out was the big rush of endorphins that she was experiencing after birth. If you haven't already seen her home birth video, you should because she looks like she's on drugs and in the coolest way. So let's go over what to do to create the most optimal birth experience and cover those big topics like delayed cord clamping, postpartum hemorrhage, and delayed infant bath together. Care providers all over are waiting to cut the cord until 
there is no pulse and it is completely white as long as baby and mama are healthy and doing great. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology suggest waiting at least 30 to 60 seconds of delayed cord clamping. Dr. Fogelson is known as one of the top experts in the subject of delayed cord clamping and he says in his article the benefits of delayed cord clamping appear to be clear for iron stores and reducing iron deficiency anemia he states how immediate cord clamping clearly reduces the amount of blood in an infant in terms of blood volume blood cells, as well as iron content, which otherwise would be destined to be received by the infant if the cord had not been cut. He also states how in preterm neonates, there appears to be a benefit in terms of intraventricular hemorrhaging as well as sepsis. He also points out how there is no real data that delayed cord clamping is at all harmful to the infant. Care providers all over encourage natural delivery of the placenta where there is no tugging and no pitocin being used. And if you are doing delayed cord clamping, it is common for the placenta to be sat in a bowl next to mom and baby, especially in a physiological undisturbed birth. A PhD labor and delivery nurse who is the founder of Evidence-Based Birth suggested this article by midwife thinking and said how she couldn't have explained the information better herself. And in this article, midwife thinking wrote an interesting article on the evidence about the topic of postpartum hemorrhage, explaining why the evidence suggests that active management, giving Pitocin and more things, may be more beneficial for most women giving birth in hospital settings. As we investigate this topic, it is important to know how postpartum hemorrhage happens. Midwife thinking boils it down to ineffective uterine contractions as the main cause of postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage occurs after the placenta placenta is out and can and does occur in c-section births as well. So let's break this down even further. There are two main causes of ineffective contractions after birth. One being hormonal due to inadequate circulating oxytocin or an inadequate uterine response to oxytocin such as in a long induction. And two, mechanical due to something being in the way causing the uterus to not be able to contract such as a full bladder taking up space or pieces of the placenta that have been left behind, or even like a large blood clot. In this article, Midwife Thinking came down to two conclusions on what she thinks would be best to do as it pertains to postpartum hemorrhaging. When a physiological, unmedicated, undisturbed birth does not take place, especially in a hospital setting, active management is needed to birth the placenta. She concluded with a Concrane review that active management reduces the risk of postpartum hemorrhage in an all-risk population that is birthing in a hospital, commonly where routine intervention is the norm, but they raise concerns about side effects, increase blood pressure after pains and vomiting, reduce birth rate for baby, and more women returning back to the hospital for bleeding. So what to expect with active management of the placenta? an artificial version of oxytocin is given to initiate uterine contractions. Then the cord is usually clamped and cut, and sometimes the placenta is drained, and then usually pulled out, hopefully using controlled cord traction. But midwife thinking thinks that this part of the active management is where most of the problems occur, stating how if you pull on the placenta that has not yet detached, it can cause some blood vessels to be torn or torn open with the cord tugging, it is super important that your care provider waits for there to be signs that the placenta has already detached, such as a trickle of blood and a lengthening of the umbilical cord. You can also accidentally start to detach it before the artificial oxytocin kicks in and then have no contractions there to stop the bleeding. You could also more commonly snap the umbilical cord and the care provider will usually have to grab the placenta out himself or the mother, if she can, should be encouraged 
courage to stand up to further encourage the placenta to come out. Or a rare but worse scenario would be to actually pull the entire uterus out. So the idea of not tugging or pulling on the cord at all may be a good one. In her article, she brings up a study that states the omission of controlled cord traction or cord tugging did not increase the risk of severe hemorrhage. And in another study, they found that controlled cord traction made no difference to the postpartum hemorrhage rate. She also pointed out how non-epidural women should have the option of getting upright and pushing to get their placenta out safely. On the other hand, in a physiological, unmedicated, undisturbed delivery, a natural delivery of the placenta may be best. In an undisturbed setting, active management of the placenta was associated with a seven to eight fold increase in postpartum hemorrhage compared to the natural physiological approach. And in another study, women having undisturbed physiological births, active management actually increased their chances of having postpartum hemorrhage. Keep in mind that a safe and physiological placental birth requires effective endogenous oxytocin release. Okay, so now let's go over a few things that happen to mom and baby after birth. Newborn babies don't have the ability to control their temperature very well, so it's important to keep them warm and dry. It would be good to cover a mom and baby with a warm towel directly after birth. Skin to skin or kangaroo care is also a great thing to do after birth. Women who did not have skin to skin and breastfeeding directly after birth were almost twice as likely to have postpartum hemorrhage compared to women who did not have this contact with their baby. Also helping baby to keep Keep warm and regulating their temperature. To ensure that this be done, you can suggest that all newborn procedures be done in your arms. As long as mom and baby are doing great, they can lightly wipe off, suction the mouth, check the heart, or whatever they need to do to make sure that mom and baby are doing great. And let's also go over your baby's first attempt at breastfeeding. Directly right after birth, most babies aren't ready to nurse just quite yet, but if they are showing any feeding cues at all, go ahead and latch them. It is recommended to breastfeed baby on each side until he or she unlatches or falls asleep. Then you can offer the other side. I personally was recommended to breastfeed on both sides just 15 to 30 minutes, especially since I was fair skinned. In my experience, my first feeding on one side was about 45 minutes long before my labor and delivery nurse caught me and saw what I was doing. And that one side that I did feed longer on was super sore and even cracked and bled. And I highly recommend Mother Love Nipple Cream as it is lanolin free, which is especially great for fair skinned mothers. In my nutrition prenatal class, my professor really emphasized on the golden hour, on the first hour after birth. Making sure that you breastfeed at least 15 to 30 minutes really good on each side within the first hour. The mechanism behind the importance of this is that it is activating all the milk ducts and training them for all the nursing sessions to come. He stated how that if you don't activate as many during that first hour, then the ones unactivated will not even be used throughout your breastfeeding journey, just the ones that you activated within that hour. For me, it was very rough that first week, but that side that I had nursed longer on was always my strongest side and produced more milk than the other. If you are looking for the gentlest and most peaceful entry into the world for your little one, then weighing and measuring and regular newborn procedures should occur at least an hour after skin to skin time and after the first attempt at breastfeeding. And most moms delayed about 24 hours for the PKU testing. It would also be great to delay your infant's first bath. In a study of almost 500 babies published in the Journal of Obstetric, Gynecologic, and neonatal nursing found that delaying a healthy newborn's bath for more than 12 hours after birth resulted in a greater rate of exclusive breastfeeding in the hospital and increased rates of mothers 
planning to breastfeed. The World Health Organization recommends delaying your infant's first bath at least up to six hours and ideally 24 hours after birth. Baths can easily make them cold and physically stress them. The waxy whitish vernix that coats your baby's skin protects and moisturizes them while also keeping her warm. It may also help baby develop their microbiome, which is the gut bacterial flora, which researchers and experts think may play a role in future disease prevention. It would also be a great idea for mom and baby to take an herbal bath right after birth or whenever comfortable. Postpartum herbal baths soothe sore perineal or postpartum muscles and hemorrhoids, also slowing down bleeding and minimizing swelling, while also creating a special bonding experience for mom and baby. Midwives all over suggest herbal afterbirth bath mix. This mix can even be turned into a warm compress or frozen and put on a maxi pad. If you birthed in a hospital, you'll probably stay for about 24 to 48 hours. If you have an uncomplicated C-section birth, you'll probably be in the hospital for about two to four days. If you have a birth center birth, if mom and baby are doing well, you're usually sent home about four to six hours after birth and the midwife usually comes to check on mom and baby the next day. I'm gonna give you a list of things to research on your own as being an informed mama is super important to me. Make sure to research about vitamin K oral drops versus the shot and as it pertains to the healing benefits of delayed cord clamping. You could also research the optional erythromycin eye ointment, especially if mother is chlamydia and gonorrhea negative, or this can be even postponed to up to an hour so that you have an undisturbed chance to breastfeed. Also look into the optional hep B shot or delaying it, especially if mom is hep B negative. Also look into optional male circumcision versus remaining intact and even delaying circumcision up to the eighth day of birth and how it pertains to the baby's natural way of clotting blood on the eighth day. Also look into optional placental encapsulation Although no research on this subject exists yet, but mothers swear by it helping their postpartum depression, anxiety, and milk production. Also look into the benefits of hiring a postpartum doula and the benefits of rooming in in a hospital setting. I plan on going over all the postpartum must-haves in another video, which will be super beneficial for making this experience as comfortable as possible. But for right now, that's all I have for you in this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.